right? He's not only a member of the EXCO in MAPS, he's also passionate about entrepreneurship and he offers companies a way to navigate changes in the way we learn, work and lead. So if you are ready, that's right, our final speaker for today, not just today but this convention, is none other than Anwar, the jump boy. Anwar, over to you. Come on, let's make some noise for well, Anwar. There you go. Right. Do I hear a goal? But not too many goals. <laughs> After so much of prep, you're gonna expect me to do the sky flyer onto the stage, right? So, <laughs> no, but we've had a uh, you know great yesterday and today, and we've heard some amazing speakers, lots of content, lots of things that we can do, and standing here, you know, I'm in awe of what has been heard, but I thought perhaps I could package it into one big package. And I started by following the disruptor, you know, I decided to wear a t-shirt instead of a jacket to be a little different. But let me tell you the story of, you know, when I joined June Hotel, right? So one of the things that we wanted to do is we wanted to upgrade the role of the manager. The managers were too much responsible for cost and they didn't feel that they owned the business. They didn't feel that they ran the business. They didn't feel that revenue was their responsibility. And so one of the things that we did, we do a whole bunch of stuff, but they had one gripe. So I got into a conversation with Sharon, right? Accounts department, very important. Not about the age, it's about the power. So Sharon, you know, the managers are complaining that it's taking you so long to process their claims. And she says, but no, I know. First of all, they send it in late. <coughs> Secondly, you know, there's all these mileage claims, right? So we need to check, you know, does it really take this many, many kilometers to travel from Cyberjaya to KL or from here to there? So it takes time to check all these things, right? So it is Sharon. Sharon, what about this? Five days after they submit the claim, you pay it. Pay it exactly as they ask and that will make the managers happy. She said, oh, well, we can't do that. How can we pay without checking? I mean, you know, there might be overclaiming. I said, yes, Sharon, there may be overclaiming, but these are managers, you know, and they're not gonna run anywhere, right? So if they have overclaimed and you found something, then just adjust it in the next month. And she looks at me like, I'm from outer space. <laughs> I mean, and you know, this happens. It happened to me in many instances in Chun Hotel. And it happens to you in your organizations. You know, there are all these people who are well meaning, but they stand in the way of your organization becoming energized. It stands in the way of your organization finding a purpose. It constrains your people. And so you have people who are saying, let's get more from our people, but let's do it with two hands behind the back. You know, because you can't change this, and you can't change that, and you can't change that. And so really, that's what got me really passionate about the oldest profession in the world. Now you know what the oldest profession in the world is, right? <laughs> Entrepreneurship. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> entrepreneurs existed existed before the beginning, beginning of time, right? So if I, when I listen, when I listen to Yunus of Gravin Bang, you know, he, he says it so well. He says, you know, Anwar, they were cavemen. We were responsible for getting food. And so we had to pro provide for our family. So what do you think we did? We sat in the room and we wrote our resume and we posted it to the next caveman and said, you know, I'm very good at cutting and I'm very good at hunting. You know, please hire me so I can feed my family. Nobody does that, right? So we are born entrepreneurial. The only problem is 
that when we get into an organization, they say, you know, park your entrepreneurship outside. And, and I joke with people, I said, look, honestly, your boss wanted to hire a robot. But robots were not available. They were too expensive. So they hired you. And they want you to behave exactly like a robot. And you know, it worked well for a period of time. But today, if you look at how the world is evolving, what you want from your people, organizations that are stuck in yesterday, they're not going to exist. It's the organizations that change, evolve, that will exist. And that's something that we can learn from entrepreneurs. And so what I say is entrepreneurs are not different people. They just do things differently. And I have been an entrepreneur in many organizations that I've worked at. And I have been an entrepreneur in starting a business. Sadly, all the three businesses I started went bust. So I kept having to go back to work, start a business. Go back to work, start a business. Go back to work, start a business. And so I find that it is the entrepreneurial traits that organizations can learn from. And it's particularly important now. Why? Because there are two massive changes that we have already seen during the pandemic. And they are going to hit us, and hit us very hard. The first change is how we work. So recently, <coughs> you know, I wanted to get, I, get to know a cosmetics business, right? So it's run by my friend Debbie. So I called Debbie, and I said, Debbie, how are you doing? And Debbie is this amazing business manager. She knows all about running a business. And she wanted to start a cosmetics brand thing is, she didn't have any experience with cosmetics, right? And so she found Jennifer, and Jennifer was just leaving a cosmetics company. She knew how to formulate products. So Debbie thought, that's great. <coughs> you and I get together, we form a company, and we create new products which are organic, good for the skin, good for the environment. Wonderful. But you realize that you know cosmetics come in bottles with packaging, and so they needed bottle and packaging expertise. So they brought two more ladies on board, all women team, four ladies, launched the product. The bottles are made in China. <coughs> the product is sold in the US. And I said to Debbie, so how's it, how's it like going to work? And she said it was really rough. And I thought, well, all startups are rough, right? But she said, no, you know, getting the time right was very important. And I'm like, what do you mean? She says, well, I live in Hong Kong. Jennifer lives in Toronto. The two girls that do the packaging live in, live in Paris. The product is sold in North America. Can you imagine? This is the power of an organization that is built today. And if you are an existing company, this is the type of company you are going to compete against. And imagine the power that they have. Passionate people working on a skill set that they know, leveraging the cost structure. And you are seeing that now all over the world. The big brands are losing out. And if you are an old company that's hanging on to an old way of working, you are relying on the talent pool that's in your town, in your city, in your country, I don't think you'll last very long. Because the companies out there are working in what I call an unboxed world. They can pick from anywhere in the world. And they create powerful companies. And these companies are going to eat your lunch if you're not ready. So the first change that's happening is how we work. The second change that's going to happen is how we learn. And we heard a little bit, a few snippets about universities, etc., right? And our existing model of learning is what I call learn, <coughs> starve, hope to get a job. And that's really what happens when you go to university. Because in Asia, we're lucky parents pay for it. But in most of Europe and North America, you have to pay and you leave with student debt. So you spend all your time learning. 
then you're starving, and then you, at the end, hope to get a job. And I think, this is like a really weird combination, right? Why would I sign up for something like this? And does another model exist? Because what happens is that 80% of the students that go to university don't end up practicing what they learn. Now, I know university is a wonderful place to go and learn, and learn lots of skills, and you learn lots of other stuff. But it is not the only place you learn this. Now, I had some work to do with a friend of mine from uh, India, Sanjay, who's developed this wonderful modules for training in the logistics sector. So we had to do some tweaks, and we had to convert the language into um, Malay and Mandarin, because it's in English and in Hindi. And so Shan Sanjay said to me, he said, you know, I'm getting a quote of $100 to get it done per module in India. And I looked at him, seems like a lot. And India is supposed to be cheap. But I told Sanjay, I said, I can get it done probably for less than half the price. And so I went on to these gig sites, and I found this lady called Dayun. She's wonderful, right? I approached her, and I approached three or four people. I said, look, this is the challenge. This is what I want you to do. And if you can do this one sample, I'm happy to pay for it. Give me a price, and if you do well, then I have another 20, 25 modules to do. It had to be consistent. They had to use a machine translation so that I can get consistency across all the modules. And after Dayun agreed a price, I said, well, that's cheap, but I didn't tell her that. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I did build in a little bit of a bonus for her if she does all of them. So. Um, so within two hours, she sends me these files, and they sound very Indonesian to me, and the pacing I thought was a bit wrong. So I sent her a message, and I said, can you amend it? And Dayun came back to me in the next hour with another voice, and then half an hour later with another voice, and then half an hour later with another voice. And I said, Dayun, stop, stop, you've got the job. Let's, <laughs> let's slow down here, right? You know, we've, 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 we've fixed the, the, the Malay, now let's work on the, the Mandarin. And she did the same thing for the Mandarin. Now, it was during the MCO, and there was a restriction on travel, right? So we had one instance where she couldn't send me the file because the file was very big. So I said to her, I said, no problem, Dayun. I'll just, you know, you're on PJ somewhere, right? I'll just come by with a hard drive and pick it up. And she looked at me on, on the message. She says, I know, actually, I'm in Malacca. You can't get to drive here because of border restriction. I said, oh, OK. And then I later find out that a lot of the stuff and the software that she was using, she didn't know how to use when she, she took the job. And we heard that earlier. You can start something without the knowledge. But she learned it. And where did she learn it from? She was doing a part-time course at the university. And today, Ty told me that he also uses somebody who's only just getting into university, who's already doing the work for him. And so, you know, we have a whole bunch of people that are not following the curriculum at universities, which was, read, which was probably written, I don't know, 400 years ago. And, you know, I have been going to uh, India since the 1990s, and they keep telling me about how they can't get IT-ready people. They can't hire IT-ready uh, graduates. But that's always going to be the case. Because you've got curriculum that's developed over a long period of time, that's very sandwiched, very precise. And then you've got a whole bunch of people who are just learning as they need to learn. And we've seen bakers. We've seen people who produce food. We've seen people who produce cosmetics. We've seen a whole bunch of people who start businesses just by learning. So they have created what I call a new paradigm of learning, which is learn, do, earn. And you had the university people who are going learn, starve, hope to earn. <laughs> and then you've got these people who are going learn, do, earn, learn, do, earn, learn, do, earn. And I joke with people that in 10 years' time, if you hire somebody from university, you're hiring somebody with no initiative who doesn't know what the hell to do with their life. Because anybody who has initiative has already started on the job, right? So how we work, how we learn, is going to fundamentally disrupt us all. And the one skill that I think helps us 
get over all of this is entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurial skill set. So I talk about the nine traits of successful entrepreneurs, something that companies really need to start to absorb. They need to change the way they work. Otherwise, they're not going to survive. It's wonderful to have personal transformation of your people, of your organization, of your leaders. But unless you transform the way you work, and I look at it as a three-way thing, right? You have a rowing boat, you have people who are rowers, you know the Viking thing, and you have one guy like, crack the whip, you know, I'm the captain, crack, crack. And so what happens now is that you send all the workers out for training, they come back, but they're still stuck with the same row, right? And then that doesn't work, so after a while you get rid of the captain, right? Put a new captain, he comes in the crack of the whip again. But he's not the problem either. The problem is the boat. The boat has a hole, and you haven't fixed that. And a lot of organizations, that's the problem. The organization has a hole, and they will not accept the change. So if you work in an organization, and you all know, you're all entrepreneurs, you're building organizations, which is wonderful. But when I talk to people, and if you work in an organization where you have these challenges, then my suggestion to you is, Start your own business. Because your organization is going to not do too well. So I leave you with this one last thought. Entrepreneurs are not different people. They just do things differently. And you can too. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Anwar.